This is all about moving the internet off of screens and into the real world. Removing the medium, the separation between humans and information. Making the world the medium again. Are you ready to enter the next dimension? Yes. Now we can get started. So I have to start with a confession. I love XR. I've been loving XR for over 12 years now as an entrepreneur, investor, event organizer, and really helping build this ecosystem. And for those who have no idea what I mean by this, XR is a unifying term to describe the entire spectrum of AR, VR, MR, or, or augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. Cool with that? Okay? All right. Um, every once in a while, a new revolutionary technology comes along that changes everything, and XR is such a technology. I'm personally on a mission to spread the word and make sure that every entrepreneur, investor, corporation, and individual understands why. And you guys in this room, whether you realize it or not, are part of this new revolution. 2019 is really a special year in the history of XR. It's finally happening. But it took a long while for this technology to become an overnight success. In 1968, in the mother of all demos, Engelbert introduced the fundamental elements of modern computing. Windows, hypertext, graphics, navigation, the mouse. It was very prophetic, but it was presented on a two-dimensional screen and controlled with a two-dimensional input device, the mouse. During that same week, and that, that's the shocker, another breakthrough technology was presented. Ivan Sutherland demonstrated the principle of spatial computing, a three-dimensional display in which the image of an object changes in exactly the same way the image of a real object would change for similar motions of the head in, in the real world. And that sounds way more natural. It's definitely more natural than the mother of all demos. Our brains weren't designed for this trans constant transformation between 2D that we see on the flat screens and 3D, uh, the information that is actually representing the world. In, in principle, we solve tasks more easily in direct interaction with the real world as opposed to looking at video. So how come history chose the 2D computing path? Well, it was simply easier to implement. The tech wasn't there. But since then, computing has been a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional world. So consider carpal tun tunnel, neck pain, near nearsightedness, not to mention the impact on our memory and how we interact with others. These are all afflictions caused by using modern tech in an unnatural way. And as much as we try to evolve and ignore our DNA roots, recent trends are recognizing our origins and are promoting changes in lifestyle to match this kind of human nature. It's already impacting how we think about food, health, exercise, and now technology. So 50 years after the ultimate display demo, technology is catching up to the natural way our brains work. And it's because spatial computing is native to our species. We use our natural senses, and we interact in space, just like we did in a million years before the mother of all demos. In this month's uh, Wired cover story, it's really all about how AR and XR will spark the next big tech platform. It's a big deal, and it's sort of a signal XR will reach an inflection point in 2019. After 50 years, XR is finally set for growth. Where are we on this chart? At the cusp of a hockey stick. Scotty, can we get a little closer? Even closer? That's it. You see, we are right here. And this is a great spot, because from here, it only goes up exponentially. How can I tell? 
I'm going to make an evidence-based case today. So here are the signals that are supporting this claim. Exhibit A. As of last year, the tech giants are all in. They're making big investments, billions of investments in XR, because they, th they see this as the next growth engine post-mobile. In the lead, we can see Microsoft, Google, Apple, followed closely by Facebook, Amazon, Snapchat, and below are the main contenders. Exhibit B, Fortune 1000 companies are very enthusiastic about XR, but they're also very pragmatic. ROI studies are showing conclusive evidence that XR is improving their businesses. And here are some of the leading use cases. Um, the number one use case is in the enterprise. It, it's about remote expert assistance. You are in the field, you need to fix something, a machine, a pump, a board. You can connect with an expert through phones or smart glasses, and the experts uh, can have direct view through your eyes to help you solve the problem. They don't have to travel. They can support many people from the back office. Uh, and so far, it's sort of like FaceTime. Uh, but then you can also annotate on the actual object. And that annotation could actually be locked to the real world so that you understand exactly what you need to perform to fix the problem in front of you. And this, this specific implementation is done by Scope AR at Caterpillar, but it's been adopted at hundreds of corporations around the world. Here's the second one, manufacturing. XR is big on the assembly line in aerospace and automotive. Um, here, an example at Boeing, Upskill Software and Google Glass are showing workers' instructions step-by-step step on how to do the wiring for the airplanes uh, that we fly. And the result is 25% faster production, zero errors, and higher safety. And here's a side-by-side -side example at General Electric. The guy on the left is using the typical paper manual to perform the task. The guy on the right is using smart glasses. So he gets all the information in his field of view, all the instructions. He doesn't have to switch his attention between the manual and the task at hand. And as you'll see, he finishes the work much faster. In fact, 34% faster than the traditional way. And what's amazing is that the similar results are achieved for first-time workers. So think about what this could do to help upskill workers in the age of automation. Here's uh, another example, side-by-side -side example by Scope AR in a packing line. The woman on the left uses paper instructions, as always, while the man on the right uses Microsoft HoloLens to complete the task. He completes the task actually 25% faster, and here the glasses show him not just the step-by-step -step instructions, but actually visually understanding how to actually place this label um, on, the, on the machine so that it works properly. And this kind of thing could enable people to learn on the job, master skills almost instantly. So thanks to these and uh, many other use cases in the enterprise, Numerous studies are showing that over 70% of lar large organizations have already either implemented XR or plan to implement it within the next couple of years. All right, Exhibit C. By now, everyone has heard about AR and VR, right? Most people don't know exactly how it's going to impact their lives, but the awareness is it's an all-time high. How many people are using it? Let let's do a quick test here. How many here have tried mobile AR, and for that purpose, Pokemon Go, face filters count. Okay, I think we have about half or so. Um, according to a survey by Artillery from last year, over a third of all mo mobile users have tried mobile AR. So obviously there's still a lot of people to convince that it makes sense, but as of today, there are over one billion devices in the market that support XR. And this is a, an amazing install base to be working with. The question is whether there's any essential AR experiences for these people to use. 
So here's the answer. First of all, it's big in e-commerce. We've seen some of these examples. This is uh, by Warby Parker, just launched about a week ago, um, with the ability to actually try the glasses before you buy them. And it looks very natural, it looks, you can move your head, it feels very realistic. Uh, and it's eventually a better experience for the end user, also lower returns for the retailer, so everybody's happy. And here's another example for makeup. You can try it before you buy. You can also learn how to apply it and avoid a lot of the mess uh, that can, can be associated with it. And with this UCAM uh, application, you can also try different colors of your hair. Your hair. Uh, and look how good it is. I mean, it's really, even the, with head movements and the hair moving around, it still looks very realistic. And this is thanks to recent breakthroughs in machine learning that supports this kind of realistic simulation. And I have to tell you, I've tried it myself, and it worked great even on my head. <laughs> Here's another example about learning on the job. So when it comes to DIY, fixing things at home, instead of the typical search for the YouTube video that will help you solve the problem, apps like Jigspace allow you to focus your attention on the real world, and it guides you through step-by-step step how to solve the problem in front of you. And again, you can master things instantly at home. Remember the remote expert use case for enterprises? Well, this could also change customer service for consumers. With this app by Stream, you can connect with experts that guide you how to solve the problem at home, or they can provide you with accurate quotes without the need to spend time in traffic, visit the different homes, that need this, this help. The result, again, happy customers and happy providers. Here's a simple example of how it can be useful for anyone who travels. You want to know if your suitcase fits in the carry-on? You just point your phone, and it immediately creates this box and tells you if, it's fit, if it fits in that box. You get an immediate answer. Or you can also measure items that you want to ship in order to figure out what's the exact box size that you need for that shipment. And then maybe the, uh, the app that will make AR essential to everybody out there, it's Google Maps AR. How many times have you come out of the subway and uh, walked the wrong way? How many times does it show the blue dot in the wrong position? With the new feature, as soon as you point your phone up, it recognizes the building that it has from Street View and then provides super accurate location, including directions and those arrows that tells you uh, where you need to go. And it's way more accurate than what's possible with GPS because it's, it uses computer vision. This is really a game changer. And it's already out there for the local guides uh, on Google Maps. Soon, everyone will be able to use it. You won't need to ask for directions ever again and really feel like a local. So, so this is kind of to recap some of the use cases for consumers. Try before you buy, or even try before you do. Meet the expert. Will it fit? Learn on the job. Feel like a local, and many others. But technology is accelerating, and here's a peek into where this is going. This rabbit understands the shape of my home, the stairs, the rail, and it can actually hide behind objects in a playground. So this can make games like Pokemon Go, which we've all seen, uh, to be much more engaging and much bigger in the way people play them. So there's a lot already going on on mobile devices, but the really big jump in adoption is expected with smart glasses. When it's always on, hands-free, and you can really um, benefit from it at any task in your life. The big question is, when will they be ready for mainstream? And the smart money is, as always, betting on Apple to once again time the market right. And that's, by the way, ex is expected uh, by 2021. But the great news is that Apple is not alone. There's over 50 companies already delivering great headsets to the market. Microsoft last week just announced the HoloLens 2, probably one of the best devices out there. Magic Leap is also great. The rumors of Google Glass death were exaggerated. It's actually live and kicking in many enterprises out there. 
And in fact, most of these uh, smart glasses are used in industrial use cases because they, you know, they're super fun functional there, but they're kind of bulky and more expensive uh, than what consumers can uh, afford. But then you have glasses like North, one of the first to create smart glasses that look just like regular glasses, you can buy them under $600 in a store here in Brooklyn. And Coppin, on the other hand, is targeting a niche consumer market for bikers and delivering great value to that audience. When you look at VR headsets, it's been kind of a, there's been a barrier for adoption because they, they require expensive computers and a lot of space. But with new VR standalone headsets that do not require this pricey computer, like the Oculus Quest, we'll, we'll see uh, adoption of many more millions of people uh, using VR this year. So yes, we all want headsets, but there's no time to waste. waste. Mobile use cases already show value in the market. Social, e-commerce, industri industrial, real estate, practically any vertical you can think of. And this current mobile stage is essential to prepare the market for headsets, which explains why, Exhibit D, investors are so interested in AR and VR. In 2018, they've invested a record $6 billion in startups. So with all these proof points, it's no surprise that most analysts predict that the XR market will hit $200 billion. They don't always agree on when exactly that will happen, but definitely within the next decade. So if you're a skeptic still, remember these five signals. Tech giants are making big bets. Most large corporations are adopting XR. There are one billion potential XR users with killer use cases. Investors are all over XR, and it's predicted to become a $200 billion market. XR is on the cusp of exploding. I rest my case. We're headed to the inevitable inflection point, a shift from 2D computing to spatial computing. But with all that amazing progress, the single thing that will make or break XR is how we, as an industry, handle privacy. What does this face tell you? I'm so sorry for not respecting your privacy. <laughs> and with XR, the amount of data collected about us by corporations will only grow when everything we do is captured and analyzed on camera. Privacy will be a huge concern that must never, never, never be underestimated. Just remember this face. <laughs> but today we're celebrating because we're all going spatial. So after 50 years of getting all our digital information from 2D screens, we're moving back to interacting in space. We're entering the next dimension of computing. But we could also be entering the next dimension of humanity. That raises some eyebrows, so what can really spatial do for humanity? Marshall McLuhan, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, is known for saying the medium is the message. The idea that each medium has a different effect on the human sensorium, and as a result, changes the message. But today, we get almost all our media from screens. Interesting fact, the old definition of the word screen is actually to separate. So how can we remove that separation between us and information? In that same Wired story I mentioned before, I was quoted saying that this is all about moving the internet off of screens and into the real world. Removing the medium, the separation between humans and information. Making the world the medium again. Can we define McLuhan? What effect will it have on the message if there's no medium? For many millennia, humans consumed information directly from the real world, from people, places, and things. We can now revert back to our nature and become better. Think about it. Today, in almost every task in our lives, we constantly switch our attention between digital data and the real world. How many times? On average, 234 times per day. I just made out that number, but doesn't it sound right? 
How much time and money can we save if we eliminate that switch? What if we sync all digital, digital information with the real world? For many companies like Boeing, GE, Caterpillar, it's already showing savings. But what if, what if we could do this, we could sync the data and the physical world for a whole nation? It could increase GDP by, who knows, 20% or more. Also made out that number, but it still sounds right. At the heart of this cha change will be something I call the AR cloud, a spatial 3D map or a digital copy of the real world that allows to organize information on the physical world itself. The AR cloud enables to share persistent AR experiences with many users across many devices anywhere. And this is what was missing until now to make AR go mainstream. For the first time, we have a bunch of startups uh, demonstrating that this is possible, and many of the tech giants are following through. The big benefits, it's enabling many people to collaborate in AR experiences and allows to capture collective knowledge and organize it on the real world itself. Yuval Harari, in his book, uh, Sapiens, said that, says that what made human species the ruler of Earth wasn't our ability to think as individuals, but our ability to think together in large groups. And Wikipedia was a great example of the power of millions collaborating in knowledge creation. But now imagine what spatial computing can do when large groups of people can collaborate and create knowledge in the real world itself. We could create the spatial Wikipedia. With the new platform, we can enable people to collaborate not with text, but by visually capturing the human intelligence about everything, place, and person, and make it available not by search, but simply at a glance anywhere they go. So what's spatial computing going to look like? We have some hints, but the truth is that we don't exactly know. Kevin Kelly uses that just as past generations gained textual literacy in school, the next generation will learn it, will learn visual literacy. In other words, the air cloud will look less like a book and more like a graphic novel. So now that the tech is good enough, the focus should be on creating new experiences. And that's why I'm here at Bright, to inspire a generation that will create spatial experiences. And I want to leave you with this message. Ask not what XR can do for you. Ask how you can build XR experiences that make the world a better place. So to recap, XR is set for growth, which means we're all going spatial, where the world itself is the medium. It's the next dimension of computing and perhaps the next dimension of humanity. Thanks very much. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how you spent your time and maybe some of the applications that you're personally most excited about? How I spend my time? Um, well, in the past few years, it's been more focused on um, really helping the ecosystem through investments and guidance. Uh, so, you know, met thousand, over a thousand startups over the last three years and tried to give them some advice on, uh, you know, what's the right path for the technology as well as the business models and how to find the market and so on. Um, and you know, I, I've, I've kind of shown here some of the apps that I think are gonna become essential to anyone. So I, I think that's gonna be the big litmus test, right? I mean, can you go through a day without using your smartphone or smart glasses for certain tasks in your, in your day? And I think it's gonna take time before we use it you know, 24 hours a day. I think some of these uh, concepts are probably still uh, uh, far away, but um, I think for a certain task in our day, we're gonna use it to just be able to perform better, whether it's at work or at home. Uh, so again, hopefully some of these videos uh, give you a sense of where this could go. Um, and I'm curious, a lot of the trends that you talk to kind of speak to the potential for AR and I think spatial computing and sort of just de decentralization of computing in general leaves a lot more potential for AR in general versus maybe VR. Where do you see the role for VR in the future? And then also, what other formats do you see in the future of the decentralization for computing beyond just like wearables? So, I mean, 
on one hand, many people lump together AR and VR in many cases, uh, although today they're being used completely differently. Obviously, VR is when you block yourself from the real world and try to go to a different world that cannot be experienced in, the re in reality. Whereas with AR, you stay in the real world and you only enhance it with some additional information. Um, but the thing is that there's a lot, there's kind of a big uh, overlap between those two technologies. Uh, a lot of the foundational infrastructure, the skills, the knowledge is actually the same for both. So that's why I think it still makes sense to think about them together. Plus, if you think about you know, where these two things uh, evolve in the future, we believe that they will converge and eventually you'll have the same hardware, the same technology for both AR and VR. You can think about um, AR is when your eyes are open, you're in the world, and when you go, want to go somewhere else, you close your eyes, go into a dream, and then you're in VR. I think your, our day is going to be probably mostly in AR, because we still want to interact with people, we want to collaborate, we want to be in the real world, but then when it comes to uh, certain times, maybe in the afternoon or the evening, we'll get more into VR where we can explore new places, new areas. It's probably going to be a bigger part of our entertainment um, than, you, than, uh, than AR um, in that sense. Um, so that, hopefully that answered the question. Great. I know we have a couple of other questions, but I'm looking at the time, and I think, sadly, we need to hold them off. Uh, maybe, Ori, if you're around at the break, um, people uh, can work their way up to the front and get a chance to ask anything else of him. So uh, let's give a, Ori another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ori. That was great.